Welcome to this week of Beanie in the Boom. We got a very special guest, as we do every week. Well, not every week, but some weeks. <laughs> but Most we, weeks. <laughs> yeah, we, we got our guy Reed here. Reed, what's happening, man? Not much, man. Thanks for having me on today. Uh, I appreciate, appreciate having it. you on, man. We've been trying to get you on for some time now, and there's been some scheduling conflicts. I don't know yeah. who to blame you or Boom, oh, wow. but it, it's, it's been there. <laughs> it's been there, so I don't know which yeah. direction to go in. We won't point hey, he's he finally here, man. He yeah. finally all right, here. so let me That's just shut up and just enjoy it. Enjoy the moment. <laughs> No, oh, man, so uh, how's everything going? Good, man. Just uh, moving on from football now and transitioning from that. Um, selling insurance now, so that's what I always hoped and dreamed of as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, been a, it's been a fun process Wait, to so figure things out. What's this been? It's been your, your second year being done? Yeah, yep, second year out, um, second camp, I guess, yeah, so... Um, it's spent some time now to figure things out. Well, I know you slimmed up a ton, man. You look good. I'm trying, man. Thank you. I'm <laughs> trying. But, uh, yeah, so how's, how's, that, how's that been for you, man? I know a lot of times, you know, when we talk to guys, um, and, you the know, transition. everybody has that transition. Yeah. Some yeah. people transition smoothly. A lot of people don't. I mean, how was that for you? Was it, you know, a, a tough or was it like, you know what, it's done, I'm moving on, and, and I'm okay with that? Well, I'm sure like both of you guys, it's, it was interesting that first year or two, um, it's still kind of, you know, I still feel around this time when camp is right. starting up. Yeah. Um, I have those dreams where I'm missing practice or I'm late <laughs> to a game or something. Uh, so it, it's an interesting transition. Each year, I mean, the first year without a doubt was the toughest. Mm -hmm. Not reporting to camp this time of year uh, it was kind of a difficult time, I guess, where it just felt awkward. Uh, but this year, second time around, feels a little bit more natural and more swing of things with business. Right. Uh, I can kind of distract myself, so to speak, uh, from the football side of things. So um, I, each year I think it gets better and better. I don't miss that shit. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't miss having to go to camp. I don't miss having to be don't, somewhere at a specific time. Yeah, you, also, you also been out, what, five years, four years? Hell no. You know what's crazy is – it's 2019, right? Yeah. It's been seven years. Dang. Wow. Yeah. You almost a vet. I was going to say That's the oh, crazy man. thing, man. Hey, that's crazy. That's, that's wild, man. I was going to say four or five, too. <laughs> yep. To really sit wow. here and think, man, it's been seven years since I've carried a football, man. That, that's the craziest thing. So I, I don't think don't about it. You games at all? Camp is camp. I don't, I don't miss that. that at all. Man, being used to no. love camp, man. Camp was fun for me. Really, it was. It was a good time. That's because we. That's because we used to have to be, uh, had the time to, you know, not say kick it, but you know what I'm saying. You got to hang out with the guys, right? Man, you know, so talk a lot of shit. That was always a good time. Yeah. But nonetheless, I don't miss football. I, I love watching it. Yeah. I mean, I watch it all day long. But as, in terms of playing, I don't miss that at all, man. I mean, getting beat up and banging. I miss yeah. scoring touchdowns. I will tell you that much. Yeah. That's the only thing. I mean. That's, Scoring a touchdown is the best feeling in the world. I got to experience that one time in my career. And I mean the best feeling in the world. And, you yeah. know, this is our podcast. This isn't the show. So <laughs> <laughs> the best feeling in the world to me, man. I mean, it, you know, relax you can, now, you can Imagine relax. what I'm talking relax, about. Relax, man. Relax. Scoring relax. a touchdown triumphs that. Relax, me. relax. Nonetheless. So you say um, you're doing insurance now, right? Yeah. So yeah. how did you get into that? Uh, really, it was just kind of um, I was taking classes that I came back from football. I had to finish up. Um, actually, just got my diploma. Congratulations! This past weekend, there were some things I had to go through. Mm -hmm. It was a little bit delayed, but um, yeah, I was going through that whole process. And while I was doing that, my dad shares an office with an Aflac agent. Oh, nice! Um, Aflac. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the marketing is there, uh, but yeah, it's been a great way to learn the business and the sales side of things. Um, so I'm expanding into the broker side of things here soon. Um, but yeah, it was my dad shared an office space with an Aflac guy and kind of came in and talked to him and. Felt like something I could kind of tie these connections from OSU to. Oh, yeah. Um, Relationship-based yeah, business, man. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that's, that's what sales is all about. So I just kind of want to learn the, the sales side of things, and that was a good business model to learn from. And all the guys I know in insurance, man, they, they always say you get to a point, you work hard for five to seven years, yeah. you build these relationships, and they sit back and chill. Yeah. They just yeah. sit back and chill and yeah. just collect checks. Because yeah. nobody, I mean, once you got a good insurance agent, a good guy that, you trust going to every. You're not gonna change. What are you gonna change for? Right. Yeah, I mean, right. the millennials are the ones that are going online and you know yeah. just booking insurance with any old body. But mm -hmm. I mean, the older people. And as you get older and get a family, you want somebody that you can call and that's gonna put you in the right situation. Anyway. Exactly. So. And it gives me time to do things like this. Right. I can go play golf and uh, you kind of work on your own schedule. So I, I like the flexibility of it. So obviously, you just getting done playing football. You pay attention to what's going on. You still watch. ESPN, you still watch the Buckeyes, you no still, doubt. you know, watch the entire landscape of sports, man. What, what's your thoughts on the Buckeyes last season, and what do you think going into this year with Ryan Day having a full year under his belt? 
uh, in terms of the off season under his belt. And, well, and what do you expect? Yeah, well, I'm I'm excited because you got kind of a taste of what Ryan Day could do those three games that Irvin was down and you kind of saw what the offense can do. So I'm really excited to see a full year, I guess, where he's in control. He can call the shots on offense. Right. Um, I know there's some, there's some question marks to be filled, and I think that's only going to benefit the Buckeyes. I think, as you saw through ESPN's polls, they're 8% favorite to win the Big Ten or something like that. That's every year. <laughs> yeah, they do that's every, every year. year. But um, I think there are beyond that, though. I think there are some questions as to how this team is going to shape out, what's their identity going to be. And I think a lot of people are going to be surprised at how well uh, Ryan Day is recepted by the players. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I mean, that's one of the things I respect so much is that he is respected by the players. Yeah. Not just the guys on the roster, the former guys as well. Right. Um, that's what I love about Ryan Day. Oh, no question yeah. about it. I mean, you, He's a real dude, I think. And that's the thing, man. I'm, I'm with my kids at Top Golf, and we're, we're golfing there, and we're running to Ryan Day and his family. I mean, he was super down to earth, somebody you can sit there and talk to. Yeah. And then you go back to the point of, you know, players respecting him. That's a hard thing to do, to get yeah. guys. You come up from Urban Meyer to get guys to buy into what it is you're preaching. I know mm -hmm. we're at Ohio State and guys are on scholarship, and it's like you want to keep your scholarship, you got to respect the coach. Mm -hmm. But to get him to buy in and to play hard for you, I think he's going to do that very easily. Mm -hmm. And we saw that a little bit last year. We saw how this sure. team was completely different at the beginning of the last season, and I don't expect greater things for him in years to come. Yep. S speaking of greater, Reed, um, Beanie thought I was crazy because last week I told him, my expectations is that I think the Buckeyes will go undefeated this year. You know, I haven't looked at their schedule. That's a tough much, schedule. We just went over the shit. I mean, this shit is tough. It's not easy. I get that, but maybe I'm brainwashed in a, a super Buckeyes fan. I always fan. think they're going but, to yeah, but yeah, same we can. It's the bias same thing. Inside. Yeah, it's I always. honestly feel that we're supposed to run the Big Ten every single year. I, I agree. And to get into the playoffs, do our thing in the playoffs, and then go to the national championship. Well, that's, that's just my opinion. Bias. I always think that, yeah. I mean, I, I understand, yes, we have a new quarterback. Yes, we have a new head coach. Yes, we have a lot of uh, guys that left. But but at the same time, you guys know the Buckeyes are always reloading. There's always that next guy to step up. So it's like, you know, mm -hmm. we put all these things, all these great things together right now, and something great is going to happen. You know what I'm saying? That's my opinion. What is your opinion? I trust the system, so I'm the same way. So maybe it's biased or – uh, unrealistic, but I think we have a great. So you saying we go undefeated? I, I agree. I mean, I think I like every, every year, I think if you don't go in thinking that you're going undefeated, you're right. you're doing it wrong. Right. You know? I think we can. I'm not saying that we won't, but you, you just made the, the shit seem like oh, you want the realistic answer or the other? Real <laughs> I want the realistic. I mean, I, I want the realistic answer. I think we absolutely can, but the shit's not going to be easy. Oh well, I mean, yeah, we it's never say it's, it's, it's never hey, easy. Twelve and zero isn't easy, I bro. Mean. He made it just seem like it was a foregone conclusion that. You know, Ohio State is running the fucking table. Putting and they're the house going, on it. Exactly. I'm like, come on, bro. It's not going to be that easy. It's not going to be that simple. No, I, and, I mean, you got FAU, which is – it's not a bad team. Honestly. Like Lane Kiffin. It's, I mean, we just talked about yeah. it. Broke them down. I mean, Lane is a very creative offensive mind that's yeah. going to come in and yeah. try to do some crazy yeah. things. Now, it's going to be a stretch for them to beat Ohio State, but yeah, sure. it's not going to be easy. But so, – go ahead. You're always going to get the best shot from every team you play, and that's, right. that's something you guys both know as Ohio State players that – um, Everybody you go, circling that you go game. In, yeah, you got that get the game circled. You got target on your back every game, as we saw through Purdue. I mean, those were the games that was like, all right, that's easy. Right, <laughs> write that off as a W. But that's not the case all the time. So yeah, I'm sure there'll be games like that, like they had last year and the year before. There's always that one close game where they either edge it out or they don't. Um, but I, I'm with Boom on this one. I think I think, uh, I think they're going to be. Did you lose to Purdue? Yeah, <laughs> we all. Oh, uh, yeah, Sh shut up. Yeah, that's shut up. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's one of those almost like that's got a tough place in my heart, man. Man, <laughs> man. Shut up, man. He always bringing up old stuff, yeah, man. Like, We're looking rainy. at the future, being. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was rainy. It was one of those crap days, and see, I, I was walking there. We all lethargic. And yeah, he got some built-in excuses in there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, so um, let's talk about your time at uh at OSU. I mean, obviously you had the, the chance to play at. At Ohio State, yeah. not under just uh, Urban Meyer, but also under Coach Trussell, man. Just, just yeah. kind of talk about your time with both of them and the well, whole the whole process. I think what you said before, uh, Beanie, about having players play for you and respect you. I think that's what Trussell immediately I grasped from him and his coaching philosophies was he was kind of like playing for your dad. Mm -hmm. um, but to be able to see the three coaching philosophies between him, Fick, and Urban, I think oh, that yeah, was a yeah. blessing in itself. Um, but Tress was, I mean, coaching aside, one of the top three people I've ever met in my life. Right. Right. Uh, just a, a great human being. But um, going from his coaching philosophy where it was kind of like, you know, he didn't have to yell. I mean, there was times, yeah, sure, he might yell or pull TP to the side and say something. <laughs> <laughs> but, or a beanie. Yeah. 
<laughs> but he just had that way about him, man, where he was like playing for your dad, and you didn't really, you just did everything out of the greatness for him. And um, I think going from him, Fick kind of tried to replicate that. And I think the shoes um, were too big for him at the time. Now I think he's doing a great job in Cincinnati. Right. Um, we'll love to see him eventually get another shot at it. But uh, going from that, that six and seven year to Urban, my senior <laughs> year, um, you know, it was a no-nonsense year. It was basically you, he came in and said, you embarrassed Ohio State. Um, here's a quote I'll never forget when he came in the first meeting. 5 a.m., some guys were late, won't name names. Um, <laughs> but he said, you know that saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't force it to drink? Mm -hmm. He said, screw that. We're grabbing that horse by the back of the neck. We're forcing it to drink. <laughs> I was like, oh, we all kind of sunk back in our chairs a little bit. The next two weeks, we had those 5 a.m. workouts. Mm. And we had 10 guys quit. One of them was Jeremy Cash, all ACC cornerback, ended up being at Duke. Uh, so you had good guys that were going through this process that was just such a shakeup that they weren't used to it and it made them uncomfortable. So um, the, th the four years at Ohio State was very interesting to see those three different coaching philosophies. You know, I'm always interested to talk to guys that play under all three, but more so, you know, Jim Trussell and Urban Meyer. I mean, the biggest difference is playing under those guys because – I'm going to be honest, man. You know, when you look at Coach Tress, obviously, you know, a button depth guy, clean cut. Mm. Uh, you know, it can talk to you, can motivate you by talking to you. Right. Then you look at a Meyer, like an in-your-face, like, <laughs> F-you type guy. Not to say that he said that's the players, right. but that's, that's the demeanor that, yeah. that comes off. F-you is my way or the highway. You're either going to get with her and get out. Get what was the biggest knows. difference between those guys? Am I hitting the door on the head? Is it? Absolutely. I think, well, Urban's a psych major, so he knows how to – get in the players' heads at the right time for the right reasons. I think he had every reason to be the way he was my senior year. We were six and seven. Right. We were, you know, we were we were not playing up to our capabilities, and he knew that, and he saw that. So he came in, and he basically had to shake us by the by the head and tell us, wake up. And we all did that, obviously. I'm going 12-0. and 0, But, um, you know, I, from what I've heard from players after that year was he kind of took his, not foot off the gas, but he relaxed a little bit with the mm -hmm. locker room because guys bought into his system. And, um, not that he needed to be re anything to be respected more than what he had before he came to Ohio State, but I think players observed him and saw him just like they did with Trestle, and they began to respect him the same way with Tress. Right. Um, so it was it was kind of cool to hear those things uh, from players past a after me, I guess, and to hear how he kind of changed his philosophies, I guess, with how he uh, handled the players. That's always interesting, man. I mean, when you look at that, when you look at you know just playing under two different guys, I never had that happen to me. Um, in my career um, in the NFL or college I always was able to play under one coach um, so I didn't go through like the culture change and yep. you know the change from a mental standpoint of having to I really say suck up to anybody but I, I gotta be buddy buddy I gotta get to know this coach a little right. bit so he trusts me and I trust him mm -hmm. uh, and build that relationship I never had that opportunity um, and, and you did man what was the toughest part of playing under Urban Meyer when you go back and you look at everything uh, throughout that year, because it was a tough-ass year, you guys ended up going undefeated that year as well yeah. and would have been in – was it a college football playoff at that time? Or we were so. with the bull band. Uh, it was okay. the year before. Okay, gotcha. Like two years maybe before. <coughs> yeah. But, uh, no, it was – the toughest challenge, I'd say, for me personally was switching from tight end to tackle. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, he came in right away. I told him, I was like, I'm not – I'm not a spread tight end. It's flat out. I'm not. I know right. I'm not. I'm a blocking tight end. Mm -hmm. Jake Ballard was my basically my mentor, my right. idol throughout college. <laughs> so I was like, that's that ain't me. So I switched to tackle and put it on 30 pounds. That off season was probably the toughest while learning the position. Um, but really, going back to the season, that whole season as a team, I think we went 12 and 0. This is something we still joke about because we were so afraid as to what Urban was going to do if we lost <laughs> the last game. <laughs> but we, you know what? We don't even want to have to worry about that. Right. Let's just win, just win every game to avoid that. And you know, you see games like the Purdue game where we ended up winning overtime. It was crazy stuff like that that happened. And we laugh. Back. We look back on it and we laugh because we're like, man. If Jeff doesn't catch that ball in the end zone there in the end and we don't win that game, I don't know what would have happened, <laughs> but I'm just glad we didn't have to find out. So, Man, so, so how was that transition when you when you changed positions? And what's that conversation like when you, you, you're you talking to Urban? And do you think it was in the best benefit of your career to do that? Yeah, there's, there's obviously still part of me that wishes I would have stayed at tight end and see mm -hmm. what would have happened in the league. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy with the way that things turned out. Um, I think it was definitely beneficial to start. Um, we lost J.B. Shugarts and Mike Adams, so... Um, there was definitely a, a gap I thought that could be filled, whereas we had a, a surplus of tight ends, really, with Jeff Hireman, Nick Van Ett, Stoneburner, myself. Yep. Mm. And uh, so I think 
switching from tight end to tackle was an obvious choice. It wasn't something that was tough for me to do. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, like I said, there's still part of me that wishes I was stayed at tight end and right. given it a shot. But um, going in the NFL, learning from seven different teams, um, I take that positive out of getting cut seven <laughs> times. <laughs> but learning from all those different coaches, those O-line coaches, you kind of find what works with guys, what doesn't. Um, and seeing how these O-line coaches coach their players. Some of them are stuck to their ways. They say this is how we're coaching, you know. Uh, for example, Paul Alexander, Paul Alexander in Cincinnati, he taught the forklift technique. Right. Hmm. Never seen that. Terrible. <laughs> yeah. Terrible. And it worked, though, with guys like Whit, Whitworth, because mm-hmm. he's 350 pounds and can just catch the guy. Didn't believe in punching, really. Um, so going from that to, like, Cleveland, and where they did, they believed in the punch, and then if you caught like this, you were an idiot. So um, it was cool to see the different O-line coaches and coaching techniques, I guess, throughout the NFL. B- breaking down, um, you know, your career at Ohio State, I always, I mean, I, I'm always curious to know because, you know, you have the Cardell Jones situation, a guy that's deep on yeah. the roster, gets an opportunity to play, but is good as hell. Uh, you, you look at last year, you know, Brendan White and, and the defensive back group, he was good as hell when he got an opportunity to play, but he was buried on the bench, mm-hmm. and it wasn't until, you know, midway through the year where he got an opportunity to play. And to me, that happens all too much in college football, and there's always so many different unnamed guys that you know if yeah. they were just given an opportunity to play, they would be good as hell. Who's the most underrated guy you played with at Ohio State? Most underrated guy. Well, Cardell, that, like you said, that whole thing with him. <laughs> I mean, as you know, probably, boom, that, that was not something I expected. And right. When it happened, it was – it was awesome. So it's hard to top that. Right. Um, but he did get the chance to play. So maybe somebody that, that didn't get a chance, um, I really don't know. That, that, that probably takes the cake, to be honest with you. Kenny G, in your ear, to me, he was one of those sleeper. Oh, well, he had his chance at Purdue. He, he showed his stuff there. That was so that was his game. He showed the last, was it the last couple games of the year, of that year? Yeah. This Brass is got un- hurt. unpopular opinion right here that I'm about to give you guys. Oh, boy. Kenny G was a better quarterback than Braxton. Yeah. Well, was, so in terms of, so look, if, if he yeah, was, you in, refine, I guess. If, so if he was in Ryan Day's system, Kenny G's a better quarterback than so, Braxton. So, so I say, in terms of dropping far, back, far, throwing it, slinging it, far, far, far as an actual quarterback, yeah, throwing, absolutely, yeah. I agree. Now, as an athlete, you got to go with Braxton. I don't need yeah. the quarterback to be an athlete in Ryan yeah, Day's yeah, system. That's no. my thing. I'm saying, but overall, you know, people are listening. It's like, man, he, they might be thinking that, like, you're saying that Kenny G is an overall better player. Right, than, right. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm well, saying. I'm saying as a quarterback. Yeah, as a quarterback. That's, that's what I need you to do as, as a quarterback. thrower. As a thrower, yes. Break, uh, no, I'm saying a quarterback. See, <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't. I'm saying a quarterback. You got to You got you to be as a thrower. <laughs> Yes, I agree. I think he's better. But I thought he would. I mean, if he would have been in Braxton the right open situation. space, was just too stupid. Yeah, I mean, that was it, it was fucking freaking cheat code. I mean, exactly. I mean, that's why he plays receiver now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Point but my period. When I, I watched Kenny G throw the ball, it was it was a thing of beauty, man. It was a thing of beauty. So uh, let's let's take a, a little step further back. Um, go to your recruiting process, man. <laughs> what was that like for you? <laughs> and choosing to come to Ohio State. Um, come was from, it a, a yeah. hard decision? Or was it easy? Like, oh, I get a scholarship from Ohio State. That's where I'm going. It was it was down to Michigan State and Ohio State for me. Um, coach D'Antonio up there, uh, his staff. Great coach. Yeah, I liked it up there a lot. Obviously, a bunch of my high school buddies went there and stuff. But, um, you know, I kind of approached it with an open mind. My dad played at Michigan State for uh, two years before transferring. Didn't know that. Yeah, so it was kind of a, one of those things where, I'm okay, I'll hear out Michigan State's, like, you know, their old pitch and stuff. And then um, – I'm just going to go approach with those an open mind to hear out Ohio State. You know, you grew up in Michigan, you hear all these bad things about Ohio State, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, the doom and gloom. So I, I approached it. It was tough, but I approached it with an open mind, came down to Ohio State after hearing out Michigan State, um, came down for an official visit uh, after getting offered, and didn't think I'd be coming to Ohio State, guys. <laughs> and it's not because I didn't think that, you know, um, they wanted me, or I guess I wasn't good enough to play there or anything, but my official visit. <laughs> <laughs> you might have heard this already before, but um, we're driving to the Blackwell to check in, mm-hmm. and there's that rotundra there, you know, mm-hmm. everybody's pulling in the circle drive, um, and we're getting tailgated the whole way, my dad and I, and it's... Did you have Michigan plates? We did. <laughs> we did. <laughs> Wonder if that has something to do with it. But there was an Ohio State hat in the back of the, uh, the seat the guy could have saw, so I don't know if that was it or if he was just hopped up on something, but he was tailgating, my dad and I. As we're checking in for my official visit at Blackwell, we we get to the pull-in, and this guy gets out of his car. We're, I have my bags. I have 
holding my bags. He swings at my dad after mouthing off some exchange of words. Swings at my dad. He's got his briefcase in the back seat. I don't know if he's trying to steal my dad's briefcase or what, but he swings on me, swings at my dad. Hold on. Connect or no? No, nah, he like nicked me in the forehead just <laughs> enough to kind of trigger, to trigger that adrenaline. Right. And it was over after that. I got. I mean, it was, it was a wrap, but um, I'm on top of this guy just wailing on him in front of all these <laughs> coaches and players checking oh, in. The coach it, probably liked it. <laughs> that's, well, that's what I ended up finding out. But, yeah. you know, at the time, I'm this high school kid coming to Ohio State. Right. This is like, like my first Greg Gillum standing right there like, hey, Greg, how you doing? Like, after this, all this goes down, like, but the dude gets, I mean, I bloodied him up pretty bad. My dad, my dad thought he used a knife on the guy. He was, yeah. he was bloodied up so bad. I'm like, you really thought I'd use a knife? I'm right. Like, like, what? I'm trying to go to jail. I'm trying to go to college. <laughs> right. <laughs> No, so uh, the guy took off in his car. They sent helicopters after him. Never found the guy. What? Um, but, yeah, I don't know if he was trying to mug my dad for his, his laptop briefcase or what in the back seat. But um, Where were y'all coming from, though? We were driving down the lane, and it was literally just – it wasn't like, at the time, bumper-to-bumper bumper traffic. He was driving from 315 south, tailgating us, all the way up to Blackwell. Mm-hmm. And he just got out and looked like he was hopped up on something. And that's how it all went right, down. But crazy. What was the response from the coaches after that? Right. Well, that's, that's where I thought. I'm like, I'm like my, my heart's pumping. And they're like, all right, you good? Like, you good? Just check in. Get up to your room. Relax. I'm like, all right, all right. But I'm sitting there in my room, and I remember thinking, like, I just blew it. I just, <laughs> any, any chance I had at coming uh-huh. to Ohio State, I blew it. And, you know, my dad's trying to talk me off the ledge type deal. Like, you know, like, it's, like you were in the wrong. And, and we weren't by any means, but um, – yeah, it ends up, uh, I think um, Alex Boone hears about it and said something uh, that he liked it. And I'm slowly hearing that, you know, the coaches actually thought it was, was not that bad of a thing. <laughs> well, as long uh, as you wasn't wrong, you know what I'm saying? No, yeah. They're going to like that dog that, and they're fighting you. you that know? was, I think, what was the best part is they were able to see for themselves, I guess because everybody was out there checking into Blackwell. Mm-hmm. They were able to see how it all, I guess, transgressed. Uh, and that kind of took away any question as to if I was in the right or wrong. So... Um, I think that saved me, but yeah, I was I was for sure thought I wasn't coming to Ohio State after that. <laughs> now, did you have your scholarship already, or did they yeah. offer you after? Yeah, I had a scholarship. I think before that, okay, um, official visit, and then that's hilarious. Yeah, that was when they had twenty five guys come in for an official visit. Now they break it up to right. a couple couple days or I mean, weekends. Like, I, mean, I don't understand. So we had how about twenty guys that. coming in that weekend. Like, how are they going to spend time with that many? I remember the same way when I was being recruited. Yeah. I mean, we had about probably fifteen dudes. How are you going to spend time with my mom and dad? Right. He spent his time with his mom and dad. The one thing that they did though, they had a party at Trust's house. Oh. Yes. So the parents had, they, so they did that with you yep. as well. So we didn't get to go, but the parents, parents. got to go to Trust's house, get a chance to kick back, relax, have some cocktails, and yeah. so on and so forth. So my mom and dad were so, um, they were already sold anyways, but even more mm-hmm. after the fact that going to Trust's house and chilling. Yeah. Same so, thing for my parents. I heard nothing but great stories about it. Right. There were some drinks flowing there. Uh, and no stuff. doubt. Yeah. No doubt about it. It was a good time from what I heard. Heck yeah. yeah. So. Uh, and fast forward, I bounce all over man in these podcasts because I like to ask like so it. many fucking questions. I like it. it makes me relive um, the glory days. <laughs> <laughs> you know, fast forward to your time in the NFL, and you say you played for seven different teams. Yep, yep, seven different teams in five years, I think it was. So four and a half. How was that? You know, kind of being a journeyman in the league and, and, and bouncing from place to place, and you know, not having the stability, and then getting an opportunity to play and not getting an opportunity to play. What was that like for you? Some teams it was awesome. Some teams obviously not so much. Right. Um, but, you know, you learn a lot about yourself. I don't know how those guys do it where they have families and they bounce around right. from place to place. I couldn't have done it, I don't think, if I had, you know, a wife and kids at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I just kind of saw it as I'm a, I'm a young guy. I'm, um, I'm able to f- fulfill a dream of mine since a kid. But you try to look at the positives of it, I guess, not so much as, you know, you're getting cut left and right. But, right. Um, the reality of it is it's a business. It's a numbers game every, everywhere you go. Um, so some places it worked out. Like Tampa, I was able to play there for a year, get into for a regular season game experience some things there um atlanta it was just for me though to see you know just like ohio state these different coaching philosophies these different people you meet along the way it's that in itself is worth the journey the right. crazy ass roller coaster that it is um that's what it's worth in itself but um the game experiences obviously those are those are cool too but um you really find out a lot about yourself going through stuff like that oh you. absolutely yeah. Who would you say uh, your your favorite team was playing for, and, and who was your worst team? I would say my favorite would be Cleveland, honestly. Really? That, r- that room we had there with Alex Mack, Mitchell Schwartz, Joe Thomas, John Greco, those guys were cool as hell. Um, that was my rookie year. 
Um, I already know you're going to say who the worst is. Cincy? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right? You know, you're right. You're spot on. <laughs> <laughs> and you and I were there for a brief time, and uh, hey. I think you were there before the Colts. Is that yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the same it's, thing. They both drafted us. Uh, you know, I yeah. appreciate the opportunity. You know, but right. it, it was terrible. Was it that bad of an organization? <laughs> What's that? Was it that bad of an organization? It was just cheap. It, it's just everything. <laughs> you know, I'll call it now that I'm out of the league. I can say these things. Right. But, um, yeah, man, it's just one of the things where you recognize. Um, at the time, I didn't know it because it was my first first stop so of know. seven. Right. But um, you know, taking a step back after all that, you you kind of. Just, realize that man they really don't shell out for their players like other teams do um whether it be with contracts or just the facilities i mean we had to walk across the street to a field and have no bubble for cincinnati where it snowed you know left and right winter you go to uc to use their bubble it's like what the hell are we talking about this is an (laughs) nfl organization makes no sense so it was funny they'd be like hey guys we're practicing inside today you're like inside we're going inside the stadium (laughs) (laughs) and these that's where our, like, you know how most teams have a practice facility. Right. They yep. have a, a practice locker room. But our game our, 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 our game locker room was our practice locker room. Yep. You know what I'm saying? We used to No go, difference. No, no difference. difference. No nothing. Yeah, I, I don't understand it at all. <laughs> this is a NFL organization. You understand the money that they're making. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you go and build one? Why don't you build a bubble? Exactly. Something. Why don't we gotta you go have to UC's. a practice facility? Right. So that beyond that, too, I guess the rumor is they use green seats. Have you ever been to Paul, uh, Paul Brown Stadium? Um, they use green seats because it was cheaper than the orange. That's the joke. That just kind of sums I mean, it up right there. Probably but, right. You know um, what? I never noticed that. Yeah. When I you say that, it's like, wow, they, they really do have <laughs> green seats in an orange stadium. Exactly. Like, Next time you go there, you'll see that. You're like, wow, that, that makes sense. But, um, yeah, without a doubt, Cleveland was my favorite. Um, the, Tampa was cool, too. Atlanta. Um but yeah, since he just speaking of Cleveland, I mean, what you think about their team right now? All right, I love them, man, and, and that's a team I've been watching. I guess since I've been out, um, I don't know about you guys, but you guys have favorite teams you watch? The I Browns, guess. I love the Browns. Yeah. I'm from Akron, shit. I grew up loving the Browns. Yeah. Um, as a kid, I grew up being a Dallas Cowboys fan. Obviously, being from Ohio, you know, you root for the Browns. But obviously, I'm I'm on the train now. You know, yeah, we got a great team right now. <laughs> <laughs> on paper, yeah. on paper, yeah. So, what's your thoughts about yeah you know, the whole thing? You know, I, I like Baker. You know, I hated him. I'll oh, be honest. I think I we all did <laughs> when he planted that flag and and beat our ass that year. But um, you know, he's really grown on me. I think as a as a player, watching his passion come out through the Browns. Um, through a team I like, I guess. And uh, what he's able to do with Freddie Kitchens, that offense, I think is going to be special. Uh, but, you know, uh, outside of that, the O-line, I guess, is the one question I have. I don't really know those guys like I did before. Joe Thomas is no longer there. Obviously, I would love to see him sign him for a one-day contract <laughs> if they go to the Super Bowl. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, their defense is obviously, I think, one of the special, best defenses in the league. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how it all pans out. I wish they had hard knocks this year so you can kind of see the inside of it. How, how good was Joe Thomas, though? Was he that good? He just had this technique that if you ever tried to replicate it, you would get your ass kicked immediately because right. it would be straight <laughs> vertical, and he was leaned over so much, but it was his timing of his hands that was so perfected. It was down to a science for him that it was something like day one, they say, to every person that comes into Cleveland's offensive right. alignment, do not try to do what Joe does. <laughs> everybody tries it, and sure enough, everybody does try it, and the same thing happens. Uh, but he was just so damn good, and so he perfected his craft beyond any other player I've ever seen in the mm-hmm. league. Uh, but beyond that, though, he just led off the field in a way. He was a cool ass dude. He wasn't like, you know, some of these other guys. I'm not going to name names, but some of these other guys that, you know, had every reason to be pompous or arrogant. Right. And, and they did that. But Joe had every reason to be, you know, cocky, whatever. But he just was a real country dude, like down to earth. Uh, it was it was cool to learn from him my rookie year just what to do what not to do and he would pull rookies aside and tell them coach them up uh, it was it was cool that, that's the type of shit that always interests me is when you got these great players that are going to be hall of famers what they were like in practice what they were mm-hmm. like in meeting rooms and, and watching Joe Nile in the media world I mean, he's a funny guy yeah right. funny as hell and then I, mean, I don't know what it is with offensive linemen man they get skinny skinny as, as hell, hell. Bro. I mean 
I'm still trying to get there. I broke you too. I'm eating at 270 pounds. That's why I'm, I'm going up. I mean, you know, Joe hey, Thomas is yeah. freaking hey, 230, 240 oh, right now. It's ridiculous. Man, that's hilarious. I was just telling somebody yesterday, man, um, it seemed like the guys that play offensive of line, they all get small, and then the guys that play the skill positions, they all blow up, man. <laughs> I don't understand it, man. Yeah. Means I, I ain't calling you out, bro. I'm just saying, hey. <laughs> I'm just saying I feel like it's a hey, shot directed I, at Honestly, right no, 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 because I think Means is, is just a – he's just one of those natural big guys. Oh, yeah, he's yeah. not fat at all. Right. You know what I'm saying? You might say you're fat because you used to yeah, be in – Yeah, used to be in, yeah. <laughs> Six-packs and all that stuff. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm in the, the same boat where I'm trying to lose weight. and um, No, it's, it's a true thing, though. I think linemen either go from um, one extreme to the other. You can see guys gain weight after they're done mm-hmm. playing or they can lose it all real quick within a year, which I still don't understand how the hell they do it. But Right. I um, thought you had the trigger. That's why I was about to ask you. <laughs> no, <my> man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I definitely have not figured it out. But, yeah, I think it's just you know going from a different lifestyle. Like you're practicing every day. You're out there burning, burning calories. calories yeah. Yeah. And you're yeah. eating everything you want. You're not even thinking about it. But the moment that those practices stop, the food doesn't stop. Right. You still eat. You still have the same damn appetite. <laughs> exactly. um, so you're not, you're not burning those calories the same way. So you got to really work and, and focus on that like you did focusing on practice, I think. It, so you watch the NFL. What's your take on, you know, when you see guys holding out, like Zeke? Mm-hmm. I mean, what, what's your take on situations like that? I Man, Zeke was one of the guys holding out. Melvin Gordon. Me and Boom talked about it a little bit last week, and I yep. think Dallas is fucking crazy for allowing Zeke I agree. to not just <clears throat> not give him a contract. And I get it. You could say, you know what, he's holding out of camp. We don't need him in camp anyways. We need him during the season. But, but for them not to have gotten Zeke's contract done, although he does have two years left, uh-huh. you know he's their end-all, be-all. Yeah. So no situation. What's your thoughts? Go ahead. I think it's you know it's just the nature of the league now, or it's a business. And he flat out. I read the article yesterday. He flat out said that you know, obviously I want to be out there and play. Right. I don't think there's any anybody's questioning if he wants to play or not. I think Zeke's a hard worker and everybody knows that. Um, but you know it's just becoming that we're seeing this year in and year out. These guys are holding out, and these teams are, you know, it's a it's a game of chess. Right. How long can you wait um, to hold out? I, I think, like you, like you said, during camp, sure, you can wait You can wait that period out. But the moment you start season up, those first four games, if he sits out, they'll maybe win one. Mm-hmm. That's just the way I think he is with the team, the impact he has. So um, as an owner, as a team, as a GM, you got to, I guess, figure out how far you're willing to go, right. how much do you value Zeke, and it shows out. I think that's the – the most extreme way you can tell a player how much you value him is how long you wait. But <laughs> exactly. what's your take on it, Boom? I mean, like I said last week, I think I think Dallas definitely needs to go ahead and pay that man. Because I mean, if you look at the last three years, he's no doubt he's had he's rushed over a thousand yards e- each year. I think he's led the league in rushing. I think what the past two years or something like that. And uh, he's just one of those guys that uh, makes the Dallas Cowboys a better team overall. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's just my opinion on it. Um, obviously, like Bean said, he does have two years left on his contract, and maybe that may be a big factor in, in, in everything where maybe they want to get Dak, who's up actually this year, and you know, Amari Cooper, maybe they want to get those guys paid right now and then wait for next year. But you got to look at it like a guy like Zeke, man. He, he's, he's the difference maker of that team. He's the two most important things you want out of a running back. He's Dor- and productive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, give, 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 give the man what he wants, man. Yeah. Give him a camp, give him what he wants, and uh, and, and pay that guy, man. Right. Yeah, um, I agree. What's, what's the biggest thing right now that you're – or yeah, the biggest thing in sports right now that you're, you're looking out for that your eyes on? Is it Ohio State, some team in the NFL? Or? I think without a doubt it's the Browns and Ohio State. Okay. I mean, obviously living in Columbus, that's, those are the teams you hear about the most. Right. But beyond that, I think, um, you know, like we said earlier with Ryan Day, it's everybody's got their eyes on him. What is he going to do this year? How's the team going to respond? And like I said, I think they're going to surprise a lot of people. So I'm curious and anxious to see how that turns out. The Browns, same way. They got a, all the talent in the world there on that team, and they got a, a new a new coach in there. And um, I think everybody's kind of in the same same boat. They're all looking at the Browns. Right. How are they going to do that? I think a lot of there's a lot more hype around the Browns in Ohio State mm-hmm. as far as what people are expecting. Um, I don't know. That's tough. That's a tough, yeah. tough one to say right there. I'm, there is a uh, lot of hype around the Browns, but the Buckeyes are always Ohio's right, team. But every, yeah, for right, but for the first time, everybody's expecting <laughs> exactly. this Everybody. the year. The yeah. Browns are finally going to do it. Hell yeah. yeah. So, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. yeah, but Ohio State, I feel like, I mean, even through the They're media. They're used to it. Yeah. The me- I mean, spoiled. the media is hyping up the Browns. The media is not hyping up the Buckeyes. Right. You know, so yeah. um, Actually, those are Michigan two things. Wins. I mean, yeah. and, and this game this year. So, yeah, yeah man, uh, that's pretty much what I wanted to wrap with you. I knew it was going to be a quick show. So I wanted yep. to, you know, get you on and 
and chop it up a little bit. Uh, definitely want to get you on again. It's my birthday today, man. So I'm, birthday. I'm I'm getting out of here with my kids. <laughs> yeah. We're going to have a ball. I got to get my daughter a phone. I got to awesome. get my other son some AirPods. So yeah. um, it's going to be a, a long, strenuous not so happy birthday That's for me how because I'm going to be with the kids. kids. Exactly. No question, man. No question. <laughs> Big hey, 31, man. My happy sister didn't give me breakfast this morning, so I, I'm happy about that. Yeah, but nonetheless, awesome. uh, it's a kid's day. Yeah. It's not your day. It's a kid's day. <laughs> no, man. First thing it's, it's, it's our day. Right. I mean, exactly. <laughs> they, they wake up and they ask me, Dad, can we go get this? I'm like, all right. Did they say happy birthday first? No. <laughs> they didn't say happy birthday until we got <laughs> <laughs> Later on, they told me. Later on, they did. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, by the oh, way, oh, yeah, by right. the way, Dad, yeah. happy, happy birthday. birthday. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> Let's go get the marathons. Yeah, right. <laughs> Nature of the beast, man. Uh, that was so, man, you got something else, Boom? You nah, good? man. I mean, I think we covered up uh, pretty much all the little questions that we wanted I, to ask. I wanted you, to man. get that story, man. I'm, I'm so glad I got the story out, man. Of you, yeah. We, we've ass. kind of talked on that. Austin and I talked <laughs> about that before. Right. Uh, so that's that's really the first time I've told that story. I guess. <laughs> but. Well, yeah. I'm glad you uh, you did choose Ohio State, man, because yeah, you were really. coming from Michigan. That was a fun four years. Yeah, that was yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. certainly appreciate it. Man, that's a wrap on Beating the Boom. It was a short show today. It's my birthday. I'm getting out, and I'm enjoying myself. Thanks to our sponsor today here at Roosters. It's been amazing. Look at all this great food. I think we're going to dig in before we get out of here. So yes, thanks sir. again to the great people at Roosters. This is Beating the Boom. Thanks again to Reed as well. Enjoy your day. Thank you.